glad to be here. I appreciate very much the privilege and the honor to be with you all, the opportunity to come back. <clears throat> Most thankful that Beverly was able to come with me. You all know that she struggles from time to time and doesn't get to go a lot. And so I think last time I came without her, and I don't like that. <clears throat> um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I hope that things are good for you all. It's been a year since we've been here. Things are different. Some things are better. Some things are not. I, I was thinking <clears throat> during the song service, it's amazing to me. I can be go just blowing along, singing a song I've sung hundreds of times. Um, there is a habitation. And for some reason, my mind went back to Davis, Oklahoma, 10 or 15 years ago, before we lost Brother D.J. Bird at Davis. At Davis, we would have eight or 10 people on a Wednesday night when I would go there to speak, and D.J. always led, he always sang the bass part of the chorus in that song. <clears throat> so when we got to that part tonight, for some reason, D.J. popped into my mind. Um, and I say this all the time, songs are powerful. If you lead songs, think about that. Somebody's got a memory with whatever song you're leading. If you are a person who writes music, which I have absolutely no talent for, <clears throat> um, understand that people will have great memories, sad, happy memories, whatever, of the songs. And tonight when I, we were singing a song, I, I wanted to bring that up. Also, <clears throat> I don't know about y'all, but it's been a little bit hot, a little bit dry at home. I've been through hotter summers, 1980, I remember. I've been through drier summers, again, 1980. But I, it's so hot and dry at home, the weeds are dying. The grass died a long time ago, but now the weeds are dying. So um, I'm assuming you all could use some prayers. Uh, we got rained on four times coming down, but it didn't rain at home, and it wasn't raining here. <clears throat> it has rained all around me for the last week, but hasn't rained on me. Um, and so um, I know the Lord has a reason and a purpose, and I think sometimes that purpose is to remind me how much I need Him and how much I depend on Him. This evening I want to read, I want to mention one verse from Psalm. I'm going to read a couple of verses from Luke. They may not seem like they go together, but they do. And I will tell you, honestly, I, I did chat with Wesley a couple of times by text, letting him know we're, we're running behind, we're hope oh, we're going to make it. We did not talk about what I was going to talk about tonight at all. And yet it's going to go hand in hand with a lot of what he prayed about. We're going to talk about working. Talk about what kind of workers we are. Um, and I'll get to the reason that I thought of that the past couple of weeks. In Psalm 122, verse 1, is a verse that is very familiar. One of the most famous verses David wrote. Psalm 23, I guess, would have to be probably the most famous. <clears throat> Psalm 122, verse 1 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It might not seem like it has a lot to do with what we're going to read from Luke. <clears throat> but if you would turn to Luke chapter 10. I'm going to read the first couple of verses in Luke chapter 10. I actually want to read verse 2 and 3. In Luke chapter 10, verse 2, the Bible says, Therefore he, Jesus, said unto them, the disciples, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord, to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. <clears throat> Believe it or not, our job as members of the church, is to work. Now, that the, the, the capacity at which we work, and that various people with various talents, differs. The jobs of the women, the jobs of the men, the jobs of the young, the jobs of the old, are not always the same. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. We all have our place in the kingdom, and we all have a job, and we all have an impact. Every one of us, regardless of who we are, how old we are, or how experienced we are, <clears throat> I started thinking a couple of weeks ago, it's different in Oklahoma, way up north, than it is down here. I've already had two weeks of teacher meetings. We started, I don't know, like a week after we got out, it seems like. July 18th was our first meeting. It's my 23rd year. I'm not bragging, I'm just a <laughs> fact. I sat beside three people who, this was their first year. Let me tell you, they got there earlier, and they were more eager and smiling bigger than I was. Because this is their first go around, they can't wait to get in the classroom. They can't wait to teach those kids. They can't wait to be a teacher, they can't wait to go. I showed up because the contract says I have to. And I'm just gonna tell you, that is something I battle after this many years. I don't dislike my job, but it is not near as much fun, not near as exciting as it was 23 years ago. 
It's just not. It's not worse. And you know, people talk about schools being worse. I don't think ours is. It's just, <clears throat> I used to end the year tired. Now I start the year tired. And I get tireder from there. By the end of the year, I'm just, I'm running on fumes. An important day in my life in the future is November 11th, 2025. When I turn 62 and I become officially eligible to retire in Oklahoma. 2027, which sounds like it's way off, is even better because then I become fully vested and eligible to retire. Now, I don't, I'm not one of those people that's going to retire and do nothing because I'm of the financial status where I'll retire and do something else like many of you are. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I catch myself looking at it like that sometimes. So often, I'm ashamed of myself sometimes. Because I'm paid by the school just like I was 23 years ago. I need to be working just as hard as I was 23 years ago, be just as excited as I was 23 years ago, just as eager as I was 23 years ago. But I'm going to tell you, I am supposed to be at school at 745. Now, I drive a bus. It's a little different. I'm there at 6 o'clock. But if I'm not driving the bus and I had to be there at 745 years ago, I'd have been there at 715, raring to go, getting ready, excited. Today, 744, I'll be pulling in the parking lot because I'm tired. Because we got new people coming up and they can do it. Because I can see the end. Now, I have worked with people who retired long before they stopped working at school. They quit working a long time before they left. I'm going to talk about that in regard to the church tonight. <clears throat> David was not a member of the church because the church did not exist. And I understand all that. But David was a child of God in the same form that we are under a different law. He was not a brand new child of God in Psalms 122. This was not his first rodeo. He wasn't at year one. I don't know how many years he'd been around God's people. I don't know how much experience. I didn't date. I didn't go back and do the counting of the years. But David was not new to this game. But still in Psalm 122, he said, when they say it's time to go to work, I get excited. I'm going to tell you, when I got my letter in the mail, my welcome back letter in the mail, they try to make it as nice as they can. We're so excited for a new school year. Oh, uh -huh, yay. I got my letter. I was not happy when they said it was time to go back to the school. I'm not upset. I'm not angry. I just miss my family. I miss the time off. I miss resting. I miss not having to tell some kid 35 times to stop throwing stuff out the window on the bus. David said I was happy when they said it was time to go to the house of the Lord. In Luke chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus said to the disciples, I want you to look out there. Now, right now, it's probably not a real good time to think about looking out there because all you'll see is dead, crunchy grass. Somebody asked me how my yard was the other day, and I said, crunchy. It's not supposed to be crunchy, but it is. Jesus pointed to a field, and he said this, the harvest truly is great. What he means is there's much to do. So much so, I can admit, and I think you probably know, we're not going to finish. We're not going to get it all done, no matter how hard we work. But just like I tell my students in school, the same thing my teachers told me in school, son, you ain't never going to get it done if you don't get started. I'll have students, when I give them an essay to write in class, We'll be there in class for 25 or 30 minutes before they raise their hand and say, Mr. Deering, what is it, Kevin? I don't have a pencil. I said, it took you 25 minutes to figure out you didn't have anything to write with? No. Son, you're not going to get finished because he never started. Jesus told the disciples, there's so much to do. You're not going to be able to get it all done. Pray that the Lord sends forth work. Oklahoma and Texas, both as states, have serious teacher shortages. Way more equipment than are coming in. And I understand that. I do. But I'm going to tell you, part of the problem at my school, any other school, or your job or any other job or any congregation is not just that we're not getting new blood in. The blood we got ain't doing nothing. There's places where they need workers among the people they already have. My home congregation at Gailey. 
congregations I've been a part of in the past, congregations I'm a part of now. You know, we visit so many congregations, they're kind of like home. I've been going to Davis at least once, sometimes twice, or three times a month for over 35 years. I'm not bragging. That's just the fact. I've been going there for that long. Some of y'all have been members of the church longer than I've been alive. We don't get to retire. You know, I can mark on the board November 11th, 2025. That's never going to mean as much to you as it does to me. 62, I can say I'm eligible to retire. But you know what? When we are in the church 35 or 40 or 50 years, we don't get to retire. There's too much to do. Too many people depend on us. So my question tonight is, what kind of worker are you? Attitude-wise, I'm not talking about results. You know, Paul told the Corinthian brethren, he wrote about the fact that, you know, I, I, I planted a Paul's water, and we, neither one of us had anything to do with the increase. I can tell you right now, I'm, I, I am still growing some weeds at home I haven't watered them a bit. I don't have to work. I didn't plant them. I don't fertilize them. And I don't water them. But they grow anyway. But the plants in the flower bed, done. We planted them. We fertilized them. We watered them. They're still dead. They're dying. Things we don't work at continue to grow. Things we work hard at continue to die. I'm obviously not in control. I might tell myself I am. I might try to be, and sometimes I can have some effect, but I'm not in control. The church is really the same way sometimes. But I think sometimes we convince ourselves in the church that because I'm not in control of the outcome, I can use that as a crutch to not work very hard. Sometimes I'll get students that the teacher before warns me, this, this boy is not a good student. Oh, then I don't have to try very hard. Because I'm wasting energy on this one. Because he's not going to learn anyway. That's really not a good thing. It's not fair. And so I think sometimes we see passages that talk about the fact that only God can give the increase. And so we say, well, you know, why bother? No matter how hard I work, he's in charge. So if I don't work, he might still give the increase. Think about that. Think about the fact of the work we do in the church. You know, I have there are brethren in the church I've dealt with for several years. Kyle Pruitt's one of them. EMT guys, ambulance folks, as I call them. I don't know what all the designations are, but there was a brother that passed away several years ago. There had been an ambulance guy, EMS, EMT, one of those things, for about 40 years. Good friend of mine who was excellent in his job. He taught EMS stuff to other people. And we had a conversation one time about jobs. He said, Roy, you've got an important job dealing with kids. And I said, yeah, if I don't do my job, some kid can't conjugate his verb right. If I fail at my job, some kid can't write a complete sentence. You know what? I can do my job as well as I want to, but they still can't write a complete sentence. But I said, you, on the other hand, if you don't do your job, people just die. His job's different than mine. But you know, every job is important in its own realm. Not everybody stands in a pulpit. Not everybody travels the world like Paul did as a missionary. I had a conversation at home the other night with somebody about mission work. And I did this with Noah. I haven't got the opportunity with Caleb yet, but I said I promised myself years ago with both boys I would take them or send them with somebody on a mission trip because I feel in the church we, every one of us, have two options when it comes to mission work. Go do it or stay home and support it. There's no other option. There's not a third option. You either got to be part of it or stay home and support But you know what? Come, when it comes to the daily work of the church, when it comes to the worship service, there's only one option. Be part of it. I want to read you again what, what David wrote. I was happy, I was glad, one translation says, when they said it was time to go to the house of the Lord. Now, I know we don't have the temple that we go to. I understand all those things. But, I, you know, I want you to think about something. Our worship is a public outshowing. A public example of the work we do. We only worship basically an hour and a half, I mean a, a, about three hours a week maybe. If we have a meeting, maybe a little more. Most of our week is not spent in here. There's lots of work to do. But when we think of the work of the church, I think sometimes we focus just on the worship. I want to talk about that for a minute. The worship is generally conducted in some congregations by two or three and some fortunate congregations by six or seven men. Meaning, 
If it's not my turn to lead songs or give a lesson, I can just sit back and cruise. Just put it on cruise, sit back, and take it easy. No don't have to listen to the songs. I've heard them a hundred times. No need to listen to the lesson. We've done Galatians chapter 4 six or seven times just since I've been going here. You know, I, I know we think about those things. Several years ago when I had open heart surgery, the surgeon came in that morning and he said, now don't be worried. This is a piece of cake. He's going to cut my chest open, break my ribs apart, spread them apart with a little mechanical thing, disconnect my heart, do, put it on a machine that hopefully is going to keep me going until he gets done sewing up what he needs to sew up. Then they're going to jump start my heart. And again, we're going to hope it starts back up and it's going to wire my chest muscles, bones together and sew me back up. Not a big deal. We do this, he said, 1,600 times a year. And I said, well, I don't. This is a big deal. This is my only time, hopefully. He said, well, we only lose 1%. And I said, that's way too many. Because what if I'm the 1%? I understand his perspective. He can't focus on losing people. And I understand he does this 1,600 times a day. could probably do it blindfolded. I hope he didn't, but he probably could. But, you know, I think about that sometimes when it comes to studying the Bible. I think about that when it comes to picking out a song. I think about that when it comes to inviting people to church. How many times have you done that? <coughs> How many times have you talked to somebody about the gospel? Let me ask you a question a different way. How many times has someone talked to to them about the gospel. This might be your thousandth time or ten thousandth time. But it might be their first. You know, I don't care that he does 1,600 a year. I really, personally, am not concerned about the other 1,599. I hope things went okay, but I don't lose sleep thinking about that. I lose sleep thinking about mine. So get in there, get lots of sleep the night before, have plenty of coffee, not too much, and do a good job. Focus. What if he treated my heart the way I treat my students sometimes? What if he treated my heart the way we treat the work of the church that we're supposed to be doing? Now, I know some of you might not be missionaries. You might not be spreading the gospel in an evangelical term. But all of us do. But I want to ask you some questions this evening. You don't have to answer them out loud, of course. Do you absolutely love worship? David said, I was glad when I said it was time to go worship to the temple, to the house of God. Do you really love worship? Now, asking on a Friday night at a meeting is generally, sometimes you've got people that are going to go no matter what. And I understand that. It's like asking on a Wednesday night. Those are the ones, you know, we can have 75 again on Sunday morning. 25 on Sunday afternoon and 13 on Wednesday night. And I think that's probably a brotherhood-wide percentage. I'm not, I'm not perfect myself. I've missed. I understand. But you know what? I'm not talking about do you go every time. There are people not here tonight that I can not promise you would rather be here. Do you love it? Does worship interest you when you're here or do you become easily bored in worship. Now I remember when I was a little boy, my folks are both members of church. My mom passed away. My dad's not faithful anymore, but he's still a member. When I was four or five years old, I had to be dragged to church because I had to sit still for two hours and I didn't like it. <laughs> church was not the highlight of my week when I'm four years old because I don't like being quiet. I still don't like it. it I got bored easily. You know, I can only count how many times a preacher touches his glasses so many times before it gets boring. Do you worship every time you get a chance? Are you glad when the opportunity to worship finally arrives, or is it inconvenient to you? When you attend and participate in worship, do you do so with a good attitude and a happy heart? Remember, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul said, first of all, sing with the spirit and the understanding. They said, pray with the Spirit and the understanding. I'll give you a couple of examples. I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with Sacred Selections, the old red book. Every congregation that we go to has the, big, the old red book, or they might have another book in addition to that. I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with number 120. I just picked one. 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And you know the next line and the next line and the next line and the next verse and the next line. You don't have to read it. You don't have to have it in front of you. We can sing it by memory. All the verses of it. Because you've heard it a thousand times, if not more. And so, if you're not careful, I think we might not sing with the Spirit and the understanding. Because I'll tell you, sometimes I've heard people get up and they number 120, and I'm like, oh, no, not again. And I, th I think, Roy, it does not matter. This, we've got some young boys at Gaby that are starting to lead songs. Well, I know why they're leading 120, because we all know it. They know it. They don't know the other 600 songs in the song book. And so I understand it. But I am thinking of me. I've sang that song 400,000 times, and I want to sing something. But you know what? I can't think like that. Because then I'm not singing with a spirit and understanding. When somebody prays, are you praying with them in the public prayer and service? from the heart. I'll use an example and I've talked to the family and made it, they understand I've done this. I don't know how many of y'all remember Brother Louis Costa. Ivan's father from California moved to Oklahoma. Louis was a tremendous brother. But I can tell you I've never met anybody who led a longer prayer than Louis Costa did. Sometimes it was longer than the lesson. Louis would pray and he would pray and he would pray and the opening sentence would be like two and a half minutes long before he ever got started. And I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to make fun of Louis at all because I can tell you no matter how long the prayer was and they were never short, sometimes they were shorter than others, but they always exceeded 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. Always. And I remember when Caleb, I think, was about three or four years old, Louis led the prayer and when he got at the end, toward the end of the prayer, and it was a long one, it was even long for Louis's prayers, he said, Lord, we want to pray for these people as if we named them one by one. When he got through, I think Caleb said, you mean we didn't? Because that's a four-year-old reaction. But I also want to tell you, never would you have heard, never today could you hear somebody lead a prayer with more sincerity than Louis Costa. His prayers would be long and beautiful. And he would be crying literal tears in his prayer. Because every single time he prayed with all of his heart, it wasn't the same. Because he prayed for what was on his heart and whoever he thought needed prayers and whatever he needed to pray for. Yes, it was long. And sometimes with my short attention span, I was never tested, but I can promise you, if anybody ever had ADD, I did. I think they had a treatment for it when I was a kid. They sent us to the office and it was cured. But I can tell you, I have to work and stay focused when something goes long like that. I've gone long up here in this building before. But Louis was the kind of person who led a prayer that I think challenged me to pray with the spirit and the understanding. Because how dare I amen a prayer that I didn't listen to? How dare I go through a song with an opportunity to praise the Lord or sing about Jesus and not pay attention to it. Every time I think of this lesson, I think of that song, It Is Well With My Soul. If you think about the man who wrote that song and you think about the situation in which he wrote that song when he had just lost his entire family, everybody in his family, he lost them all. Life doesn't get any worse. But his thinking was, well, at least it's well with my soul. That song, if you think about it, like we're supposed to, can't help but move you. Because I've been through days like that. Where the only good thing is that it's well with my soul. But does anything else really matter? When you sing a song, when you observe the communion on the Lord's day, do you do Jesus the justice of honoring him? You know, Paul says let a man examine himself, make sure he partakes of it in a worthy fashion. That doesn't just mean that you do it mechanically properly. One cup, one loaf, one leavened bread on the first day of the week. That means we do it in here properly. Jesus said, 
when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So I ask that question. When you participate in the worship service, do you do it with a good and happy heart? Does it take a lot to keep you from worship? Or do you find various ways to miss the worship? Is it common for you to miss the worship when you're not sick? You know, in the last two and a half years, we have, as our family, we've missed more church than we've ever missed before. COVID, I think, in fact, I think, you know, Caleb works at the hospital, the, the Native American hospital, the big Indian hospital, ain't it? He works with a company there that they're stringent. I mean, strict on everything. So he told us he got tested four times last week because he had some allergy symptoms. He got tested four times last week. He said, Dad, I've been tested 35 times now. He said COVID once. But you know what? We all know sickness has been more prominent. The kind of sickness that's supposed to keep us away from people. And I understand that. I don't, and I, when I had COVID, my temperature was almost 104. I probably shouldn't go to worship with a temperature of 104 unless I want everybody to get to share my COVID next week. I understand we get sick. I've got a brand new grandbaby I'll brag about. We'll brag about all weekend. But I understand Noah and Brooke sometimes. I've been in their shoes. Sometimes getting the baby ready for church is the most impossible thing on earth. You ever try to dress an eight-month-old? Or as soon as you get them dressed and you got to redress them because something happened? I understand all those things. I do. We live around train tracks. I understand the trains. But you know what? I have worshipped for years with a particular person in the church that was 15 minutes late every single service. That's not an accident. Because the distance from her house to church has never changed. If I show up for my job 15 minutes late every single day, about three days is all I'm going to make. Like I tell my students that we start, we start a week from Monday. My students will come in, I'll have some new students, and I'll have somebody like me try to come in late just to see if they can get away with it, and I'll tell them, that's one. <laughs> what do you mean? That's one tardy. We're going to treat this like a job. After two more, don't bother coming back. Because in hopefully someday you're going to graduate and get a real job out in the world, and they're not going to put up with it. I have to put up with it. But they don't. You think the Lord's happy if I plan to just drag in whenever I feel like it? You think the Lord's happy when I miss services because I'm not actually sick, because I just don't want to go? Are there a number of things you'd rather be doing besides worship, or do you find yourself thinking about worship when you're not here? Those are just some questions. Again, I, I'm not here to scold anybody. I'm not, I, you know, I don't think about work when I'm at home, generally. But I do think about home when I'm at work. Now, that doesn't mean I can't still do my job, but I can promise you the boss would rather I focus on work. I understand that. We understand that. We understand that about job. What kind of person would you be? What kind of worker are you? If you were brought in to have your evaluation, I have an evaluation every year. Sometimes they're better than others. Sometimes they catch me on a day when I'm not at my best. Sometimes they might catch me on a good day, and I'm thinking, good, that was a great day to come. Thank you for coming today. But you know what? If the Lord were to bring me in for an evaluation, Paul told us to examine ourselves. If the Lord brought me in for an evaluation, would he rehire me? If the Lord sat you down, remember the Bible says in the book of Luke, well, Mark also has an account, where the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, good master, what must I do to have eternal life? It sounds like a job interview. Jesus told him to keep the commandments. He listed some. The young man, I think, puffed up his chest because he was happy. I've done that. I've kept the commandments. Jesus said, yet, yeah, like I said, one thing. If my boss came in and said, Roy, you just need one more thing or we're going to have to let you go. I think I'd pay attention because like it or not, my family needs me to keep working. The kids are still hungry. Electric bill's going to come due, and I'm kind of scared to see it. I understand. But you know what? If Jesus told that young man, you need one more thing. Think if Jesus told you there's one thing keeping you out of heaven. Would you not listen closely? Write it down and get to work on it right now? He told that young man, take what you have and sell it. Give the money to the poor and come and follow me. One, one passage says the young man went away sorrowful. The other one says he went away angry. 
I think what he literally, he, he didn't say it, but what he basically told Jesus was, I want to go to heaven, but I don't really want to go that bad. If Jesus were to sit me down, I, I, unfortunately, I think he might have more than one or two things to address. I don't think he'd say to me, oh, there's just one thing you need to fix. I'd be rare to go. I think he might say, Roy, sit down for a minute. We need to talk. Because most of us have several things to think about. Well, what kind of worker are you? What is your attitude toward work? I want to read you a couple passages. In Exodus 34, verse 14. The Bible says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord <laughs> whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. You know, one of the things about my life, I'm, again, I'm not complaining, it's just a fact. I'm a school teacher. I write children's books. I mow lawns in the summer. I haven't mowed many in about six weeks. <laughs> it ain't growing. And I preach on weekends sometimes. I stay busy. You know, at some point, one of my bosses along the way probably wishes I'd just focus on one thing. Because I'm kind of scattered over here and scattered over here and going over here. i got to do this, and while I'm doing that, thinking about this, and all the way down here, I'm thinking about 15 other things, and I'm not complaining. It's just the way things are for a lot of us. The Bible says our God is a jealous God. If I'm working for Him, if I'm expecting my reward, He wants me working. Remember the church allowed to see in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said they were lukewarm. He said, I'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. Now that, to me, sometimes, when I think about that right off the bat, that makes sense. Would you rather have me just sort of serving you, Lord? No. Sort of serving the Lord does more damage than not serving Him. It's a bad example to so many people. But Jesus said, if you're not all in, then just get out. He said, I'll vomit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. He's a jealous God. He wants us working in Psalm 29, verse 2, the Bible says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Now, he's talking specifically about worship. But you know what? Our whole life is worship. Wes, isn't that right? Our whole life is worship. Our work at home, our example at work, at school, the things we teach our children, all those are worship. Now, they're not the congregational worship, but our entire life as a Christian is worship. Does your worship, do you as a worker, Give glory due unto the Lord. Or are you just halfway serving Him? You know, most of you are familiar with, I don't know if it's this way down here, at, at home, half of our businesses are closed early today. Not just today, but every day. Places that used to be open until 10 now close at 7. Because we can't get any workers. Every place I go to has a sign. Now hiring. Workers needed. Apparently, today's generation doesn't want to work. Can't get anybody to work. I understand that. You know what? That's irritating to me. I am the customer. I want to go in and be able to get something to eat if I'm running behind. But no, I had to be there 15 minutes ago because they closed at 7. Or I need to go in and pick up my medicine. But the pharmacy, we've got a pharmacy in Ada that's not open on weekends at all anymore. I guess you're only supposed to get sick Monday through Friday. But it's because they can't get workers. Listen, people are suffering because people aren't doing their job. Think about that from a church perspective. If I go in the quick stop that I go in every day, I go in roasters every day. Beverly teaches me about it. I go in roasters, quick stop every day. Get the biggest sweet tea they have because it's got to last me all day. I teach out in the middle of nowhere. So I can't leave and go get anything else. So that sweet tea is not that big. I wish it was. But it's, I have to have it. But I went in the other day because of supply chain issues, because of COVID. All we have are the little baby cups. I said, where's the manly cups? I'm a big guy. I need a big cup. That's not the end of the world, but I thought it was going to be because we didn't have a big cup. You know what? People, if you haven't noticed, they get irritated when things don't work their way. If you go through an order, and we don't have that right now, sir. We went to KFC one time, and they were out of chicken. They said, would you like something else? And I said, well, what else do you have? It's irritating. But you know what? When we don't do our job, it's not fun. If I don't live a good example as a Christian, people's souls 
our mistake. Now, I know the whole world doesn't watch me. I'm not egotistical enough to think the whole world watches me. But believe it or not, somebody does. Somebody watches you. If you don't believe that, think back to your children, your grandchildren. You will catch, if you don't have children yet, when you do, you will catch them doing things you've done. Good and not good. Somebody watches us. If we don't do what James said in James chapter 3 and control our tongue, somebody hears us. If we don't do our job as Christians, people's souls are lost. That's not just bad scores on the 8th grade reading test. That's not just somebody not being able to pump gas because the gas pump's not working. Or somebody can't order a chicken and cheese sandwich because they're out of chicken. Or you can't go get your pharmacy rep medicine because the pharmacy's closed. Those are little problems. They're inconvenient, yes. But when souls are lost because we're not doing our job, That's why in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus said, Look at, he said, the fields are white in the harvest. There's a lot to do. We have passed 8 billion people in the world. I don't know what the population of the San Antonio metropolitan area is, but it's a lot. Because they were all in their cars when I was coming down there. There's a lot. There's a lot of people. I don't know how long this congregation's been here, how long it will be here. Hopefully it'll always be here. But you'll never reach them all. It's just not going to happen. You gotta try. Because everyone you reach is worth it. Years ago, Brother Randy Tidmore mentioned to me that somehow the church had got a notification that a man in Spain had gotten on the internet and wanted to obey the gospel. There's no church anywhere near Spain. <clears throat> so Randy Tidmore, somebody else got on a plane and went over to Spain to try to work with this man, baptize him, and try to work and help establish at least two or three people. Randy said, we got back and some people complained about how much it costs for us to fly over to Spain. I don't know what it costs, but I would want to pay for it. Is it worth it? I can promise you it's worth it for that man. Was the time well spent? I don't know. Ask that man. Randy and them, you know, how many time zones they crossed, how many nights of sleep they missed, they were away from their families. I don't know what happened, but I know they baptized a man. If we don't do the work, souls are lost. When we do the work, sometimes souls are still lost. But at least they have a chance. In John chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus had a conversation with what we call the woman of Samaria, the woman of the well. Remember, she approached Jesus and she said to him, Sir, I, I perceive that thou art a prophet. She could tell there was something special about Jesus. I'm not sure what all she'd heard, what she might have seen, but she knew enough about Jesus somehow to realize I've had this burning religious question and I think this man can answer it. She said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And so she said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you say that in Jerusalem is where the place where men ought to worship. She had a question, a legitimate question. Where do we need to go to worship? I want to worship. I need to know where to go. She's confused, so Jesus answered Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. The time was coming, he said, when it's not going to matter where you worship. You know what? We can worship in this building. We can worship in the parking lot. We can worship out on the middle of the freeway. We don't get run over. A lot of people during the COVID uh, pandemic worshiped in homes because they didn't want the neighbors calling the police on them. We had some congregations in Oklahoma the neighbors called the police on them. So they had to go meeting in people's homes. That's fine. It doesn't matter where we worship. But Jesus said, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship him. God, he said, is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And I think we do that. I think most everywhere you'll ever go in the Lord's church, people worship in truth. Occasionally you might have something you need to discuss and help some brethren iron out. But it's not common. But spirit, that might be a problem. Because I've got, and I counted today, 347,000 things on my mind. And so do you. Ten things to do today, ten things I didn't get done yesterday, hundred things to do the next day, all of them at the same time. 
It's like trying to remember who all needs prayer. It's hard. We need to worship in spirit and in truth. We need to be there. I want you to think about something. The word that the Bible uses in reference to worship means to literally or symbolically fall down in front of someone of importance in a manner in which they deem appropriate. For instance, in those days, kings and princes wanted to be worshipped. And so the king would decide how you reacted to him. I'm just a peasant, and so the king would expect me probably to bow in front of him, maybe kiss the ring or whatever, I don't know. Now, whether you do it or not, that's up to you. But if you want to show pure reverence, the king decides how he's revered. I don't get to say, hey, here's an elbow bump. That's what I want to give you, okay? If it's not what he wants, he's not going to accept it. Think about that. To worship God means to give him reverence in the manner that he deems appropriate. They never know you. Learned that lesson, Leviticus chapter 10. They did it wrong. They died. So we understand worship. But you know what? Our Christian life is the same way. Some of you in this audience I've known a long time. You've known me a long time. Some of you I don't know very well, but many of you have been around the church a long time. I understand you get tired. I do. We'll have those new teachers... August 8th, come roaring down the hallway, 8 o'clock in the morning, raring to go, smiling. And I say, what are you so happy about? <laughs> We're starting the school year. I said, yeah, only 180 more to go. Because <laughs> teachers count the days, trust me. We know the days. I know how many days till Thanksgiving. I know how many days till Christmas. I know how many days till Labor Day. I know all those things. But you know what? Their attitude is different because it's new to them. I don't know if you can remember when you obeyed the gospel. Remember in the book of Acts? The Bible talks about Philip and the eunuch. They were traveling. Philip's joined in the chariot. The priest to him, Jesus. And the Bible says a little bit later, the man wanted to be baptized. Philip baptized him. What did he do? What did the eunuch do? He went on his way rejoicing. And I tell people, if the eunuch, before he met Philip, had money problems, he still got money problems. If his wife or his children were sick, guess what? They're still sick. If he had trouble in his life before he obeyed the gospel, he still got trouble in his life. Why is, he, why is he rejoicing? Trouble hadn't changed. If his back was bothering him, it's probably still bothering him. Because he's excited. He's got heaven in view. You see people when they obey the gospel like that. They're thrilled. They want to set the world on fire. It's like buying a new car. You wash it every day. That lasts about a week. Then you stop parking it at the back of the parking lot. I tell people all the time, when you buy a new car, they ought to just go out in the parking lot and you get in and scratch it for you. Just get it over with. That way it's not new anymore. You don't have to worry about it. You see people when they get married, we call it a honeymoon period. I don't know why people can't work at making the honeymoon period last forever. Because it's not new anymore. Let me tell you, brethren, tonight this job's not new to most of you. You've been around a long time. They're sitting, as they say, your first rodeo. You may be tired. When I used to worship at the Ader congregation, one of the problems we had at the Ader congregation was the blessing of three gospel preachers that most everybody knows. Carl Johnson, Joe Heisel, and Don Pruitt. And then came along a guy named Kevin Presley and Doug Hawkins and Anthony Brockett, some other guys. You know, we had, we had more preachers we could shake a stick at, as Bruce Roebuck would say. And so what happened in our congregation, which was probably 100, 125 people, is 120 of us were sitting back waiting for those five guys to go do something. Because they're the preachers. Or we're waiting on Brother So-and-so because he's been here since the dawn of time. He knows everything. He's been working. You know, Brother So-and-so told me one time, he said, it's time for me to quit. It's time for you young men to start working. And I said, well, I half agree with you. It is time for us young men to start working. But guess what? You don't get to quit. I know it gets tiring. Paul said twice, be not weary and well-doing. Brother, my whole point tonight is, first of all, examine what kind of worker you are. 
Do you work with your whole heart? Do you, do you earn the reward you're about to get as best you can? You're never going to deserve it. But are you doing all you can to try to be worthy of it? The Bible says we're supposed to walk worthy of that name, worthy of the calling. We're never going to be worthy of it. We try to walk worthy of it. If the Lord walked in in your life and sat you down and had an evaluation, would He rehire you or would He say, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth? you're not doing anything. Are you one of the few out trying to work the fields, doing all you can, knowing you're never going to finish, but trying your best? Does this congregation have someone they can depend on in you? You know, one of the things I thought about the last few months at the Gaily Congregation, we don't always know on Wednesday evening or Sunday evening if the man that's supposed to give the study or the sermon that day, do you have COVID? Is he going to be there tonight? We don't know. Sometimes it's 729 and they're not there yet. So we're looking around going, did you read the chapter? I tell the boys, my boys, can't even know both, read the chapter ahead of time because you never know when you're going to get caught on the spot. You know what? The congregation, men, needs to depend on you. Sisters, the congregation needs to be able to depend on you. Not for the same things. There are things the sisters can do and ex are expected to do that I can't do. I can't be a mom. I can't teach the younger women how to love their husbands. There are things the congregation needs that I think sometimes we're not getting done. And I think part of it is because we're tired. It's somebody else's turn. I got no problem with the young people stepping up. I got no problem with us expecting the young people to step up. But now that I'm not one of those young people, I can tell you there's not a time for us old people. And yes, I said us old people to stop. You know, I know Wes went to Denton County for a long time. I'll tell you all stories we close. Several years ago, I don't know how many years ago, I got a call from one of the Ballard boys. I don't remember which one it was, actually. He said, Brother Roy, I'd like to invite you to come down and speak at our young speakers meeting. At the time, I'm like 50. And I'm like, I get to go speak at a young person's meeting. I'm going to go speak at a young speaker's meeting. You know where I'm going with this too, don't you? <laughs> he said, well, um, what we're trying to do this year is have two speakers tonight. One, a real young guy, and he hesitated. And I said, and an old guy. He said, well, I was going to say more experienced, but yeah. And so my ego was shattered because I wasn't being asked because I was a young guy. But you know, I liked that approach. Because I understand in every facet of the church's work, it's time for some of our young people to step up. But it's not time for our old people to step back. We don't get a chance. We don't get a retirement in the church. We work until we die. But it's worth it. You know, I don't know what the Oklahoma retirement for teachers is, but I can promise you I'm going to look back and go, man, it wasn't worth 25 years. Heaven's going to be worth it. No matter how hard you have to work, no matter how long you serve, no matter how many battles you have to fight, and some of you I know have fought some battles, and some of you unfortunately will have to, in the church and outside the church, We've been through some battles in the brotherhood. We'll be through more. The last two years have been difficult in a number of ways. But I can't promise you the next two are going to be just as difficult some other way. Jesus told each of the seven churches of Asia, all of them, if you're faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of life. What he didn't go into a lot of detail about was what it takes to be faithful unto death. You know, some of those churches had a lot to deal with. Those first century Christians being faithful unto death wasn't a very long trip for some of them. But it was a hard road. Whatever you go through for the church, whatever job you have to do, whatever battles you have to fight, heaven will be more than worth it. Never let go of that. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep working. And never forget this. 
every time I shirk a responsibility, somewhere, somebody's soul could suffer. We do the most important work on earth. There's no greater work to be done. I don't know what your day job is, and that's fine. This is more important. By far. Being a Christian mother and a Christian father is the most important job you'll ever have. Being a Christian is the most important job you'll ever have. Do it to your best ability. And when you fail, and you will, we, as we're about to talk about, have an opportunity to have our slate washed clean. The Lord will forgive us. Tonight, if you remember the church and there are things in your life that are wrong, if you failed at doing things, if there are things you should have done that you have not done, understand, James said, to him who knows to do good but does not do it, to him it's a sin. If you shirk your responsibilities, that's wrong. It's wrong of us. I just hope many times when I have, people's souls did not have to pay the price. I hope people have been okay in spite of my mistakes, but I still need to be forgiven of them. But tonight, if there's sin in your life and you want to take care of it before the brethren of this congregation, then happy to help you become a stand.